Hello and uh, welcome to Smart Grid Seminar, produced by Stanford Bits and Watts and the many other uh, co-sponsors. For Bits and Watts, our mission is to engage research, education, and the industry to develop innovation for the 21st century electrical power grid. My name is Liao Ming, the managing director of Bits and Watts. It's my honor to be the host for today's webinar. This quarter, our webinars will be highlighting Stanford postdoc and their research work. In the last several years, we always invite external researchers, scientists, and engineers to give the lectures here. And we saw that postdoc also bring tremendous experience outside of Stanford, and also now is working with Stanford professors on different topics. So this quarter, we'll be highlighting their work. Today, our presenter is Dr. Omar, Tara Duman, I'd like to hand this over to one of Omar's mentor, Professor Charlie Costa, and also the co-director of Bits and Watts to introduce today's speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to be here today and also to uh, introduce uh, Omar Tara Duman, who's um, joining us from just down the street. And uh, uh, Omar is, uh, a new postdoc here. He started in the summertime last summer, um, which seems like such a long time ago now. Uh, he is um, received his bachelor's degree from Bill Kent University in Turkey, and his uh, PhD just last year from uh, MIT in uh, Cambridge, of course. And he works in the area of market design, which is you'll see is highly relevant to today's today's talk. And Omar is here for a, a two-year postdoc, and we are absolutely delighted to have him here. And we're anxious to see him uh, in person when this uh, unpleasantness of COVID is, has passed us by. Um, his talk today is entitled Impact of Storage on Electricity Wholesale Markets. Thank you, Liang, and thank you, Charlie, for a lovely introduction. Uh, so today I will talk about economics of grid scale energy storage and the, the plan is, uh, so we'll first try to make a case for energy storage and why we need energy storage. And I will introduce a model uh, that can incorporate energy storage impact in the wholesale electricity market. This model is going to be uh, sort of a, the energy storage that I'm going to use in this model is going to be canonical. So any type of uh, energy storage that you have in mind in a technology can be incorporated in this model with some caveats, of course, I will uh, also mention about those. And then I will apply this uh, framework to South Australia and I will talk about some results and why South Australia is a good example uh, for energy storage. Then uh, if I have time, I will share some thoughts about energy storage need in here, California, Kaiso as well. So uh, producing cl clean electricity, as you know, it's, it's very important for decarbonization uh, as it accounts for one third of overall CO2 emissions, but not only for that, but also as a foothold for other industries in this transition as well, such as transportation and heating, uh, producing clean electricity is, is very important. And the way that we basically try to make our uh, grid more green and uh, clean is with renewables. Uh, but renewables comes with, they come with a caveat, they're intermittent, they're not dispatchable, so their production changes uh, with, the, with some exogenous factors. If the wind doesn't blow, you don't have the production from wind power plant, or if the sun is not up, you can produce from your solar PV, and that causes imbalance. And in the absence of energy storage, we use inefficient and high carbon emitters to units to maintain this balance. And, um, sure many of you are familiar with the with the dot curve that we have in, in California. So in the green line here you can see this is a, a demand uh, of electricity in Kaiso yesterday and this green line is demand and this blue line is net demand which is the difference between demand and renewable generation from wind and solar. So you can see this ramp which is caused by basically uh, the, the sun uh, so as you can see this when the sun is down, solar PVs cannot produce. And because of that, the renewable generation decreases and you need to ramp up some 
fossil fuel power uh, generation uh, generators, and you basically waste some energy and increase the carbon emit, uh, emission a lot by ramping up this this net demand. And this problem is 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 going to uh, this problem will deepen more as we have more renewables because this curve is going to go even down and more down, and uh, we will probably have a point where the overall renewable generation is probably going to be higher than the demand, and then we need to curtail, etc. So energy storage is basically a technology that capture energy produced at one time to use at a later time, so it makes uh, electricity more durable. And in electricity markets, such technologies provide different services. And surely services, it can contribute to reliability at the distribution level, also the transmission level. It can provide some transmission relief, it can be used as a transmission asset, it can deal with curtailments, and it can engage in price arbitrage in time. What I mean by that is energy storage can buy electricity when the price is low and sell back to the grid when the price is high and make revenue out of this arbitrage opportunity. So the thing that makes energy storage a little bit different than conventional power plants is the opportunity cost of producing electricity is basically the price of electricity at the time of charging. So with the conventional power plants, the cost is the fuel cost, but here the cost is, the, is, is also a dynamic part of this market. So that makes energy storage's problem a little bit different than uh, most of the conventional power plants that we have. So there are different levels of markets for energy storage. There's a household level, such as the home energy storage systems, EVs, which can help by decreasing rooftop solar PV waste or can provide some resilience uh, or help with the congestion and line losses at distribution. Uh, also community level energy storage can help with that uh, as well, that uh, help with the congestion and line losses. It can also provide some extra resources for virtual power plants or distributed energy resource aggregators. Uh, but in the grid scale, it can provide lots of other things as well. And today's focus is going to be about the grid scale one. So why energy storage is, is, is now such a hot topic or like why we are more interested in energy storage nowadays, is mostly because uh, the costs are decreasing. So as you can see here, there are uh, most of the, like there are different battery technologies, also some of the old ones like pump hydro, uh, the one thing that is interesting about energy storage is there is no silver bullet. So there is no one technology that has all the attributes that we want. Some of them are good in terms of the cost structure. Some of them are more efficient. Some of them are uh, vastly available. Some of them are ge ge geographically not available. So we, we, we probably need to uh, use some combination of different technologies in the future or even now uh, but it's nice that every one of these technologies seem to have a decreasing cost. And today I will, even though my model is canonical, I will focus on lithium ion batteries uh, for a couple of reasons. First is that's the most popular one now for the grid scale applications. There's a huge decrease in cost over 70% in the last decade. <laughs> it's very good with dealing with intermittencies because it provides very fast adjustments. And there is no locational dependence. You can put energy you know, lithium ion batteries pretty much anyone, anywhere on the grid, uh, and it doesn't require a lot of uh, grid expansion. So there are lots of intensive programs all over the world, including California. And there's a discussion about the ownership. Like there's a recent FERC order, 841, also 2222. In California, there is a mandate for utilities to have an energy storage. But in our card, for instance, uh, utilities cannot have an energy storage. So uh, energy storage makes money, as I said, by using the price uh, differences. And if there's a variance in prices, it creates revenue. But while doing that, it also changed social returns. Uh, first of all, there is a price impact. So if the energy storage is large enough, it's going to have a price impact. And that will induce a transfer between consumer and producer surplus. Also, due to this price change, there could be a change in market power in common firms. In California, we are all familiar with the 2000, uh, 2001 energy crisis and market power. Uh, so energy storage can also help to mitigate this market power by smoothing the prices. And it can also provide some 
efficiency, increase in efficiency of production uh, by basically changing the marginal units when it's buying, when it's selling. So when energy storage is buying, the electricity is more, uh, electricity is probably cheaper. So that means the cost of electricity production is lower. So energy storage can buy that electricity and switch that up with the, with the time where the energy uh, electricity cost is higher so that it can in introduce uh, uh, more efficient electricity production. In the same spirit, it can change the CO2 emissions, also can help to decrease renewable curtailment. And as I said, these are particularly significant when storage is large. So my question is, are incentives for investing and operating such technologies in a host electric market socially efficient or not? So related questions with that, should we need to, should we subsidize energy storage? Is it welfare improving? So does the market work? Does the prices or like incentives in the market uh, create socially efficient outcomes? And how about the CO2 emission impact of energy storage and how energy storage and renewables are interacting? And also policy relevant question, who should own an energy storage? Because different ownerships can result in a different uh, outcomes of, 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 of operation of an energy storage. So to answer that, I build a dynamic equilibrium framework to quantify hyd hypothetical energy storage impact in a whole electric market, in which I allow for storage is uncertainty about future prices. Excuse me. I allow for incumbent firms, like fossil fuel generators, to respond to such entry. And then I endogenize storage's price impact by finding new equilibrium prices. So there are two technical challenges to do that. First of all, as I said at the beginning, energy storage's problem is dynamic. So how much you can sell depends on how much you can have in your battery or how much you can buy depends on how much you have. So that's basically an inherently dynamic problem. Also, another problem is calculating these new equilibrium prices. So in many wholesale electric markets, firms are required to submit their millions to produce as supply functions. So the equilibrium concept that we use here to find the equilibrium prices is supply function equilibrium. And it's hard to compute the supply function equilibrium. It, sometimes it's not unique, sometimes it doesn't exist. So I basically circumvent that problem in this uh, paper by using uh, estimated best response to observed variation in demand volatility. So I will talk about this, but you can think of this as a, I model energy storage uh, production as a shock to renewables or the demand. And then I simulate this grid scale energy storage in the South Australian market. So as an example about what energy storage does in real life, we have a Hornsdale Power Reserve in South Australia, which is the biggest, which was the biggest uh, lithium ion battery that was online until I think last year. So here you can see in these two graphs, the blue line represent energy storage production. So above zero means that energy storage is producing and giving back to the grid. Below zero means that energy storage is buying from the grid. And the red line represents the price path for a whole day. So in the, on the left-hand side, you can see a stable price day where the price doesn't change much. So energy storage doesn't actually produce much. But on the right-hand side, you can see a volatile price day, which energy storage production basically follows this price path pretty closely. So energy storage, uh, as you see, responds to electric prices and it tries to take advantage of this price variation. In a very canonical model, I will just try to show you how energy storage changes the social returns. Here we have two periods, uh, very simple model. There are two periods. In the first period, demand is D1, and the second period is demand is D2. So second period, is the demand is higher. So PCQ here is basically aggregated cost curve of conventional power plants in the system. And PMQ is their aggregated bit. <clears throat> so as you can notice here that PMQ is higher than PCQ at all Qs. So that's because we were assuming that there, is, there will be a market power and there is a market power in the system, meaning that firms usually submit their willingness to produce higher than their cost. So what energy storage does in this case, basically it buys in first period and sells back to the grid in the second period and it, it affects prices. 
So the price difference is the part where energy storage makes it, its uh, profit. And this difference here is basically the change in, uh, in production efficiency in the overall system in two periods. So in first period, prices increase. But in second period, price decreased more than it increased in the first period. The reason is because in electricity markets, we usually see that the aggregated uh, bids here and mostly aggregated cost curve as well, they're uh, usually convex. Therefore, energy storage price impact in the later period is higher than its effect in the first period. Therefore, consumers pay less when we introduce energy storage. Another thing you may notice here is that consumer welfare is, uh, the, the, sorry, the overall change in production efficiency doesn't really depend on the prices. It depends on how much the, the uh, how much we go down in the in this aggregated cost curve. So the profit of energy storage might not be indicative for the overall change in welfare. And I will argue that the overall profit of energy storage is going to be mostly higher than the overall change in production efficiency. Therefore, if you only think about the arbitrage of energy storage at least in this uh, simple case, that we don't have an incentive to subsidize energy storage because it will make a uh, profit that is, profit, uh, is going to be higher than the welfare change anyways. Okay. So next I will introduce my model. I will talk about the electricity demand from strategies, equilibrium, and then a simple algorithm to find an equilibrium in this model. So in electricity market, usually we have the multi-unit price, uh, multi-unit uniform price auction. You have age periods for the following day, and here I'm assuming that in each period, uh, DDH, which is the uh, electricity demand for day D period H, is perfectly inelastic. There's a public signal XD you can, that everyone sees before the auction. You can think this as a like weather forecast or like demand forecast, and then the actual vector of excuse me, demand vector DD distributed conditional on this public signal. So everyone sees the signal and everyone has a distribution in mind about the demand vector. And there's a markup, uh, markup process for this signal between days. So each firm K submits a supply function SP, SKD for each of the periods. So let's say we have 24 periods. That means each firm at the beginning of the day submits 24 different supply curves for dip, uh, 24 different hours. And market and market clears where demand equals to supply uh, at all periods. So there are three types of firms in this model, thermal, storage, and renewable. And I'm assuming that renewable generator is non-strategic and its production is exogenous. So I'm basically defining this net demand as, as the demand that combustion power plants are computing to meet. So I'm basically here giving a priority to renewables to meet the demand. So from now on, when I say demand, you can think this is a net demand, which is basically the difference between demand and renewables. So thermal generators here, they receive an independent private signal epsilon JD, which is conditional on XD. And the main assumption here that I'm assuming thermal generators are myopic. So they submit their bids to maximize their daily profit. So when you think about with, uh, different technologies like nuclear power plant, nuclear power plants usually uh, they don't change their production because they don't have the capacity to ramp up and ramp down right away. So they think about the their future periods as well. But most of the generators, like in California, uh, gas power plants, they have the capacity to ramp up and ramp down very fast. Uh, so this assumption of Expect the maximizing expected daily profit is usually uh, well uh, adjusted and can be argued uh, well fit into the model. So firms basically submit their uh, bids to uh, maximize their expected daily profit given the signal that they see and their expectation of other firms' bids. Source, on the other hand, it solves an infinite horizon problem. And why this is an infinite horizon problem? It's because the energy level of energy storage is linked between days. So if you expecting high prices next day at the beginning of the day, you would want to probably charge up a lot to make sure that next day you have enough electricity in your battery. 
or in your storage. So because of that, energy storage's uh, problem is linked. And here, energy storage picks set of charge levels for the whole day to maximize its net present value. So this flow payoff is the, the revenue that energy storage makes during that day. And this continuation value depends on how much electricity that energy storage has at the end of the end of this day and the signal of the next day. So basically the assumption here that I'm making that energy storage's charge level at the beginning of the day is private information. Firms do not know energy storage's charge level at the beginning of the day. So given that, uh, the strategy profile signal star is a perfect, perfect mark of perfect equilibrium. If thermal genetics maximize their daily profit, storage maximizes its net present value of revenue and market clears where demand equals to supply. So solving this first part is usually a tough uh, task because it includes supply function equilibrium, which is computationally intractable and usually not unique. So to solve that, I uh, introduce an algorithm, which I'm gonna represent in the picture here. So let's say we are observing, uh, this is, uh, let's say we see a signal XK, which is uh, like demand, uh, uh, demand forecast or like weather forecast, which gives a distribution about net demand for the whole day, okay? After seeing this distribution, let's say energy storage, we introduce an energy storage with the strategy of sigma i. So what energy storage does, it's basically buys when the, <coughs> excuse me, when price is low. So it increases demand when the price is low and decreases demand when the price is high. So since price and demand is usually highly correlated in electricity markets, by smoothing price path, it also smooths demand. So in a sense, energy storage sort of shrinks the distribution of net demand conditional on the signal XK. So the idea here is that if I find a similar net demand distribution in the data, I can use firm strategies in this case as a best response to energy storage in the previous case, okay? So this assumption uh, relies heavily on the variation in the net demand, which is usually uh, like you need to have a rich data in terms of net demand distribution, which is usually the case in the, in the, in the markets where you have lots of renewables because renewable generation usually varies a lot and that creates a lots of different net demand distributions. So next I will talk briefly about South Australia, which is a great market for such applications uh, because wind generators make up almost 40% of the generation. And solar PV also uh, introduced some variation, but wind generators are, are much more volatile uh, between, within days, between days, between seasons. And so that introduced a very high price volatility in South Australia, which is great for energy storage applications. And there are also three firms, conventional power plants, that makes up almost 95% of the generation in this market, which is uh, uh, just a good setting for a market power examination. And also the, as I said at the beginning, the largest lithium ion battery came online here in 2018, which is the Hornsdale power reserve that I mentioned at the beginning. So I use data on forecast and realized demand and prices, which is the case how I, this is, this is how I constructed those signals and realized demand and prices. This is how I construct those distributions of demand. Uh, I use unit level half hourly bids. This is how I construct the uh, empirical distribution of bidding strategies of firms conditional on this demand distributions. And I use forecast and realize renewable generation, also industry cost and emission estimates to understand the energy storage impact in terms of the overall cost and emissions in this market. So in terms of results, I have uh, several of them. So I will first We'll talk about the price impact of energy storage and then I will mention about how the ownership can change this impact and overall uh, welfare impact of energy storage as well. <coughs> Later if I have time I will talk about how energy storage changes the incumbents revenues and then I will talk about how energy storage and renewables are interacting. So throughout this exercise I will focus on one particular energy storage. 
which is the Hornsdale and the Pub Reserve that I mentioned, uh, which is a totally independent monopoly energy storage with 120 megawatt hour capacity, uh, energy capacity and 30 megawatt uh, power capacity with an 85 round trip efficiency, which is account for two to 10% of net demand in South Australia. So this is big enough to change prices and it will change prices. So the, to distangle energy storage price impact, I follow, I compare three different cases. And first I follow a no price effect uh, case where energy storage basically takes the price path and maximizes profit. And then I will, I introduce energy storage price impact, but I do not allow firms the best response. Then in the last one, I basically uh, comp uh, compute the uh, Neve equilibrium prices uh, in which I allow for is firms respond to energy storage entity. So here in this figure, you can uh, see uh, different price paths under different modeling assumptions. So this blue line is the uh, energy level of energy storage. And the black line is the original price level before uh, entry of energy storage. So once energy storage enters and firms do not respond, the price path smooths out, this is the red line here, as you can see, it decreases uh, when the, when in the high price period and increases in the low price periods. This is, uh, this is expected as we're expecting uh, energy storage to smooth the price path. <coughs> and firms response to energy storage basically furthers this smoothing. It's mostly because when you, when you have energy storage as a market power mitigating factor, firms submit their bid more competitively, meaning that they submit their bids closer to their cost. Therefore, it further amplifies the price impact of energy storage, okay? So here I'm, I'm comparing different models in terms of the profit of energy storage and the, 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 the revenue of energy storage. So here the cost, sec the cost part is basically the assumption uh, over this technology, this particular technology of Hornsdale Power Reserve, given the, the given the assumption of this is going to last for 20 years, and this cost section here basically uh, just division of uh, such costs into a 30, 20 years period. Uh, so you can you can play around with this, but the the part that models give, model gives me is the revenue part. Okay, so if you have if, if you're expecting prices to go down for energy storage, you can play around with this part and see how energy storage is making money or not, okay? So in the first column, you can see energy storage takes prices as given and with no price impact and no uncertainty. In this case, energy storage makes revenue, makes profit. But then uh, energy, when you introduce uncertainty, price uncertainty, energy storage all of a sudden lost all of its profits. So this minus means that this is conditional on energy storage is introduced to the market, disregarding the cost of energy storage. So this is basically, this energy storage wouldn't enter the market, but if it enters, it will lose money. So that's what this minus 1.96 is showing. But the interesting thing is once you introduce price impact of energy storage, it loses even more, it loses uh, much more of its revenue, it loses 50% of its revenue. So that means that for this kind of this uh, kind of energy storage at this size, this price impact is non-trivial. And once we introduce uh, the firm's best response to energy storage, that further decreases the revenue because the price path is now smoother, so there is less uh, opportunity for energy storage to make revenue. And while energy storage making this, this set of revenues, it also changes consumers' welfare. And one thing that I wanna show you here that consumer surplus impact of energy storage uh, is actually higher than its cost. Meaning that energy storage smooths prices uh, so much that the consumers are now paying less for electricity than the cost of energy storage itself. So that sort of uh, argues that maybe consumers might want to have an energy storage in the market. So in, in a sense, it's sort of a utility saving an energy storage in the market or different sort of different local authorities might want to have an energy storage in the setting. So in terms of ownerships, I will go deep into this question. 
I, I basically compare monopoly energy storage, load on energy storage, which we can think about the demand side, and then perfectly competitive energy storage market, which you can think of as a many small energy storage that operates at the same time. So here in this figure, I'm trying to show you that how different energy storage under different ownership structures work. So the blue line here shows the monopoly energy storage, which is the energy storage that I introduced in the first part of this results. And then I, I change that ownership into the load on one, which is to say that energy storage is trying to, this load on energy storage, rather than maximizing its own profit, it's trying to minimize the cost of electricity acquisition from the consumer side. So it's basically trying to decrease prices as much as it can so that consumers pay less for the overall electricity. And the green one is the competitive one, meaning that monopoly energy storage has an incentive to underproduce because it, has, it accounts for its price impact in the electricity market. So it basically has a market power, but competitive energy storage ignores that effect. So as I said, you can think this is a many energy storage working at the same time, arbitraging, and since they're small, they don't have market power, so they do not account for their price impact in the wholesale electricity market. So you can see here that monopoly energy storage, blue line, underproduces relative to competitive energy storage, which is expected, and low down energy storage operates differently. It looks for high price impact periods. So it's one of smooth price as much as it can, uh, unlike the monopoly energy storage, which want to maintain some sort of a price difference to have at least a, a good amount of revenue. Right? So here in this table, I'm comparing profit of these such technologies under different ownerships and the consumer welfare impact. So monopoly energy storage is, as I said, this was the first slide, it increases consumer surplus more than its, its cost, but this is not designed to maximize consumer surplus. The one that designed to maximize consumer surplus, the load on one, increases consumer surplus 50% more than the monopoly one, okay? And that difference cannot be uh, just uh, the market power of energy storage, that under production uh, incentive on energy storage, because the competitive one, as you can see here, its consumer surplus impact is closer to monopoly one. So this increase in 50%, only 10% is accounted for the market power of energy storage. So the, the reason why we have such underutilization of energy storage, if you're thinking about the consumer's perspective, that we have two distortion in prices, market power of monopoly energy storage, which accounts for 10% of that increase, but the other distribution such as market power of incumbent firms, which accounts for here or like other type of uh, distortion in the prices accounts for 40%, which is more than the more than the market power concerns here. So we have an underinvestment and underutilization if you're thinking about the consumer surplus one. But in terms of the cost one, which is if you can account, you can think this is an overall welfare change, it all uh, the, the cost of a, the overall uh, welfare doesn't actually improve too much in 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 in, in, in all three cases. Okay. So in terms of CO2 impact, I found that energy storage actually decreases consumer, sorry, decreases CO2 emissions for the monopoly case. It's mostly because, uh, so there are two factors here. So two drivers, first is run trip efficiency. So if energy storage, so if energy storage when it buys and sells, it loses some of the energy that it's, it's producing. So that is uh, basically a waste. So that increases CO2 emissions because someone need to, someone needs to produce that extra amount that is going to be wasted. So that is an increase in CO2 emissions. But the other driver is the efficiency differences with, between marginal units. As I said, when energy storage buys, there's going to be a new generation that produces that amount. And when energy storage sells, it's going to replace some generation when the price is high. So overall, I found that CO2 emissions, uh, CO2 emission efficiency difference between marginal units are higher here so that energy storage actually uh, decreases CO2 emissions. But here, none of these calculations account for the price of carbon. So if you introduce a price of carbon, 
uh, that also wouldn't change things if it can go up to like thousand dollar per uh, megawatt hour. So any amount of like any reasonable, politically reasonable cost of carbon dioxide won't change the results much. Uh, but the, the reason why here the load on one increases emissions is because uh, it works more, it produces more uh, so that it wastes, wastes more so that the CO2 emission impact of load on energy source is actually uh, negative. So it increases CO2 emissions. So in, in the interest of time, I will skip this, but just to say that energy storage uh, increases gas generators production uh, because it's kind of waste energy while producing it. So someone needs to produce it. Here, natural gas generators produces it. Uh, and diesel oil generators, which are usually used in ramp up and ramp down in this setting, in this market, they lose more. But while gas generators increases their production, they actually lose revenue, mostly because the, the price impact of energy storage and the the load on energy just has the highest revenue, uh, the largest revenue impact on uh, gas generators, mostly because it has the highest price impact. So lastly, I will talk about renewables and energy storage and how they interact. So in this exercise, what I did is I doubled the wind generation and doubled the solar generation in this market and introduced an energy storage afterwards to see how energy storage's impact changes, how its profit changes, and how it changes the revenue of these renewable generations in the market. <laughs> so in the baseline, as you can see, wind generators actually lose money and also solar PV generation lose money. It's mostly because they can't really adjust their production. So they need, they basically, given this price smoothing behavior of energy storage, they might lose money. And there are two drivers for this impact. One is, as I said, the average prices changes because once energy storage smooths prices, it actually decreases average prices. So the renewables lose money, uh, but also it depends on the correlation of renewable generation and prices. If renewables are highly correlated with prices, they will lose more money because energy storage basically sells when the price is high. So price is gonna go down and if you're if your renewables production is highly correlated with prices, you're gonna lose money. And if you're negatively correlated with prices, energy storage actually will increase your revenue. And here in this case, in the baseline, we have no curtailment. Uh, but when you double the wind generation here in this market, there is a <coughs> significant amount of curtailment and energy storage actually in that case, increases wind gener generators revenue by decreasing that curtailment. Also energy storage, profit is actually increases. It's, it's still negative, but it increases a lot. Also the consumer surplus impact of energy storage increases by a lot, but mostly due to this in decreasing curtailment impact. Also, you can see that CO2 emissions are decreasing in the more rate. And uh, I probably forgot to mention, but all in all of these cases, the energy storage technology that I'm using is the same technology that I talked about at the, at the beginning of the results section. So it's the same energy storage that has more impact or less impact given the different combination of renewable generation here. And in terms of solar, the solar penetration in South Australia is not much so that uh, the impact doesn't change much. Uh, but one thing that to mention here, solar PV, solar PV generation is this correlation with prices is usually higher. So when solar is there, the price is usually higher compared to the wind. So that's why actually solar PV loses more money when you double solar generation in the, in the South Australian market. Okay, so I want to summarize here and talk a few minutes about Kaiso. So in this paper, I try to introduce a model to quantify hypothetical energy storage impact on wholesale electricity market by endogenizing the price impact. I find two market failures or like welfare improving policies from the perspective of consumers. Um, so energy storage is basically not profitable in South Australia. And this is one of the markets that has the highest price variation. So if energy storage is not profitable here, it's probably it's not profitable in most of the parts of the world but it's consumer welfare improving if you have, uh, uh, if you, if you want to subsidize energy storage. 
and there's an underutilization for energy storage. So prices are not the right incentives for efficiency. So that leads uh, to up to a ownership discussion. And I find that an independent energy storage does not really support renewables when there is no curtailment. But when there's curtailment, it supports renewables revenue and it makes more uh, revenue itself as well. So if I have time, I want to give a couple of uh, minutes about my comments on overall uh, energy storage and talk a little bit about a uh, very simple exercise in Kaiso. So in today's world, uh, ancillary services seem to be the, the one of the, the main revenue stream for energy storage. So it's a good source of income, uh, but it will evaporate rather quickly with a large storage investment because it's a smaller market compared to the, to the energy market. So I believe that we need to have a better sense about the energy storage's revenue in the energy market by this arbitrage opportunity rather than the ancillary services. And overall average cost for this type of technologies does not decrease much with the size after five to 10 megawatt hour. So there's not much of a decreasing cost and increasing uh, returns to scale, but there's a still lumpiness uh, there might be a lumpiness problem in investment, similar to the transmission expansion, uh, due to the, this increase, this decreasing uh, returns and the, the decreasing revenues in the wholesale electricity market. So that's one thing also to think about. And energy source can also provide some other products because of this replacement of fossil fuels, so like spinning reserves, um, uh, which is, we usually take for a given because this is a, a sort of a side effect of fossil fuel generators that we have in the market. So energy storage can provide some of these products as well, can be introduced to capacity markets, which is the case in PGM, I believe, uh, but we need to have more uh, rules to, to, to sustain that. So if I have time, I wanna just quickly go over one particular ex uh, very simple exercise that I did with the Kaiso. So here in Kaiso, we have four gigawatts of pump hydro in 2020, and we have a contract that announced T 2.3 gigawatt hour coming in the next couple of years. In terms of batteries, we have 250 megawatt. We hope to have uh, close to one gigawatt uh, by now, but it's uh, due to some problems, it's postponed. So we are hoping to have uh, 1.5 gigawatt at least in the next couple of years. And we expect an incoming large investment in solar PV in Kaiso uh, rather than wind. So, but this is sort of a concerning because we already have a large of uh, large curtailments like wind and solar curtailments, and these are not due to supply is larger than demand. These are mostly due to uh, transmission constraints, uh, local distribution problems, and once we have more renewables, these these numbers are going to go up and up. And uh, without energy storage, we can have uh, a lot of waste of renewables in the system. So here, what I did is I tried to think about how much energy storage we might need if you wanna sustain 100% renewables relying only on wind and solar. So I took 2020 renewable generation profiles in Kaiso, wind and solar. Uh, here you can see on this graph, the capacity factors, meaning that how much uh, wind generators and solar generators can produce within a day, given their capacity. So you can see that wind generators sometimes <coughs> produce less than 5% of their capacity in a whole day. Uh, so basically try to invest 10, sorry, try to invest 100 gigawatt capacity in each of these wind and solar generations where the peak the system demand in Kaiso is roughly 50 gigawatts. It could be higher with the more EVs, but it's roughly 50 now. Uh, so the problem is there are some days in most of the power systems with almost no wind and solar in the whole system. So that means you're gonna need a, a short run energy storage capacity that enough for this, this whole day. So in Kaiso, that is around 200, 300 gigawatt hour storage capacity to maintain the short run balance. Without nuclear or without any type of base load generators that we might have, wanna have uh, with only solar and wind, we can't really maintain this without this much of energy storage. And on top of that, there is also a, differences in terms of uh, production and capacity factors between seasons. So unluckily in California, wind generator, uh, wind generation and solar generation capacity factors are highly correlated. That means uh, during, the, during, the wind, during the summer, we have 
we have lots of generation from both of these resources, but less in both of those generations in, in winter. So if you, want, if you don't want to overinvest, we need to have a cheap source of energy storage to shift this renewable generation from this high, uh, high production uh, seasons to low production seasons. And for this, we, we need probably one, two, three terawatt uh, hour of capacity of cheap energy storage, which could, could be like very low efficiency. Uh, with that, um, thank you very much. Terrific. Omar, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I, I, now, I, I would like to remind everyone that uh, you can submit your questions through the Q&A, which is down below uh, your screen. And I think we have a very quiet audience today. So I would encourage you to submit your questions. So let me ask a kind of a non-technical question to help you uh, to warm up the conversation. So, uh, you know, you are a PhD student at MIT, now it's postdoc here. So what's the difference of your PhD life versus postdoc life? Of course, you know, COVID-19 <laughs> changed everything, but uh, generally, what's the difference between, you know, PhD student versus postdoc? So, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a great question that I sometimes ask myself, what's the difference, how I evolved in the last year? Uh, I think the main difference is like, uh, now, like even, in the, even during the PhD, you can think yourself as an independent researcher, but this is the time when you need to become an independent researcher. I think that's the, 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 the sort of a main uh, part of the transition. So uh, even though I now have uh, Charlie, John and Erica to, to, to still talk to, but I, I need to sort of uh, keep up my research agenda myself. I need to uh, try to, so there, the, the transition with the postdoc, it's, it's uh, it's kind of a uh, different environment, uh, but it's it's a, a better environment in the sense that uh, it increases the sort of a uh, individual. Uh, it gives you individual challenges to deal with, and I think this is helpful in the long run to to become an independent researcher and produce uh, interesting uh, results that people can enjoy. Great, great. Uh, now, now let's go to the technical side. So, um, you know, one graphic you show very interesting in the end is uh, uh, the wind and the solar production in the state of California over over the whole year. And uh, we realize that uh, when when wind is low, solar is low, right? And uh, so the question around that: How extendable of your model to long duration, like seasonal storage? Because the case you presented is more on the battery, which on the sweet spot about four or six hours, like charging or discharging, that's perfect, sweet spot. But for the long duration seasonal storage, is your model be, be also applicable to that? No, or no if not, yeah. what's the change? Uh, the, so the, the thing that changes in my model is basically uh, the, I have an assumption of market process between days. So in a sense that energy storage needs to make decisions based on how, uh, based on the, the how much energy that I'm, how much the, the price path that I'm expecting tomorrow. So if you introduce a larger uh, sort of a Markov chains into this uh, into this model, you can achieve uh, larger uh, sets of decisions that accounts for like six months, three months. But I think that would be a, sort of a overkill in a sense that for uh, technologies that can give you a six months or like eight months of, of charging time, uh, they're probably not interested in short run the price differences. They're probably more interested in uh, price difference, seasonal price differences. In that sense, I think the uh, sort of a strategic competition between the such energy storage technologies and incumbent firms are gonna, going to be uh, uh, more, in a, it's simple in a, in a sense that uh, such technology we probably don't have enough uh, strategic as the such strategic incentives to respond very fast. So I think that my model will be sort of an overkill for, for that type of uh, more, uh, that type of technologies. Uh, great. I, I think uh, uh, some audience also like my question and uh, they have a, a kind of follow-on question mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you know want to get some 
thought from you regarding how my market mechanism need to change to encourage long duration and the story to take advantage of the seasonal variations like you present in the end. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think that is, uh, I mean, you can you can do this in, in, in different ways. Like if you have uh, uh, sustained price differences in, in seasons, uh, you can, uh, but the free free market can can help with that, but I think that the 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 thing that we need most for is especially for long run duration energy storages is the sense of a, a different capacity markets or uh, different sets of uh, reliability payments for such technologies because um, I think like we don't have uh, we we have pump hydro so we can take some. Uh, lessons from pump hydro technologies as well, uh, but so long for long run energy storage, I think uh, we need to introduce uh, more, as I said, like long run reliability payment type of uh, structures, which is like the capacity systems that we have in different markets that seem to seems to work in that way. But to define what energy storage. Uh, with what energy storage can do in such uh, markets, which is sort of a, that they have different sets of expectations for like fossil fuel generators. Uh, uh, that is sort of a challenging part. Um, I have actually, uh, so I'm, I'm working on a different project, uh, not about the long run duration of energy storage, but different revenue streams for energy storage in PJM. And I'm hoping to find some answers in terms of uh, policy implications of uh, not just the uh, price arbitrage, but also so different sets of incomes like capacity markets, which can also help to uh, introduce more long run duration energy storage. Okay, uh, we have another question coming here. Uh, is uh, is regarding the you know how much do you think finding of the uh, entry and the non entry points of storage in Australia would change? If you consider the answer service, uh, it's okay. Yeah, example, it, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It, it, it's right on point. Yeah, it 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 was the main reason. Uh, it 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 was the main reason uh, for the wholesale electric power reserve in South Australia to enter the market. Uh, so they it actually supported by the local government. There was a fixed payment for for that energy storage, and that energy storage actually killed uh, the FKS market, like the frequency response market, it, it killed in the sense that it decreased the cost by 50%. So that was the part that I tried to mention about the ancillary services. So energy storage introduces, especially lithium ion batteries, they, ha they have a very uh, unique feature that is different than most of the uh, generators that actually uh, produces this product, this frequency response product to the market, they, they can adjust very fast. So that makes them very competitive in such markets. And in many parts of the world, like in PJM, for instance, as well in, uh, in different parts of California, most of the small scale energy storages are used to used in this frequency response market. So that is uh, the, the, the main sort of a motivation right now for uh, such technologies entry. But as, as I said, in the long run, these markets are going to evaporate very fast. And then uh, we will, we, this technology will need to rely on a price arbitration energy market. Great. Uh, let me let me ask uh, the, the last question, kind of uh, uh, concluded today's conversation. Uh, and uh, is there, but you you mentioned the uh, uh, FERC A forty one and twenty two twenty two, right? And if you look at the products at different markets, like Kaiso, you touched on that, and PGM. You know, we have a demand response products. We have a, a, a energy storage products. It's called differently, like California, we call it NG, NGR, non generally provider. And uh, how your model is applicable or extendable to handle the DER, which is different, distributed energy resources, which is different, uh, but also has a similarity to the storage. So in DER, uh, I think it's, it's it, it's simpler in the sense that we are expecting the ER to not to be, uh, especially like the one that is in FERC order 2222, we're expecting such uh, players to be not big enough to change prices. So in, in, in a sense that uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's kind of a simpler uh, because you can 
play with the, the, that price. Since the price impact is not large enough, you can't really, you don't really have to think about the, the strategic, uh, this, uh, this strategic interaction. But I think in DR, the, the, the more challenging part is how utilities are interacting in the wholesale electives market and how is the, like, who's the, who the, who the owner of the DER and how the households of like maybe DER is, is, is sort of owned a couple of generators from the households or like the local communities, how sort of a interaction in that, uh, in that market is I think more challenging to model. And uh, like my paper is mostly about the wholesale level and I can, my model can help to take uh, some DR strategies given and then try to understand the impact of that in the wholesale electives market. And in a sense that my uh, ownership model, which I assume that uh, the perfectly competitive energy storage market can help with the understanding of how, like if you have lots of DER, how much revenue that they can make. Terrific. Thank you, Omar. Appreciate. Okay, let's conclude uh, uh, your presentation and, and, uh, and the Q&A. Uh, in the end, I'd like to uh, remind everyone that uh, we will have uh, the next presentation and the seminar from uh, uh, Catherine Wagner. As I mentioned at the beginning, you know, this quarter, we're going to highlight different uh, postdoc program and the postdoc and their research work at Stanford. And uh, the previous, and today's speaker, Omar, and the previous speaker, Nicholas, are both funded by Bits and Watts program. So next week, we're going to highlight a different program and uh, uh, a very interesting work, which is uh, slightly different as you heard today. And uh, uh, last week, we will discuss uh, the model that uh, Catherine developed uh, to help come up with a strategy uh, for the insurance uh, of natural disaster. That will be very interesting, especially under the situation what happened in California and Pacific Gas Electric. With that, thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. And uh, its webinar is recorded. We'll post that to the Stanford Bits and Watts website, which is energy.stanford.edu slash bits and watts. Thank you. Have a good afternoon.